right, so uh, my name's Sarah Williams. I'm a clinical professor of emergency medicine out at Stanford, uh, and my um, gig that I'm really passionate about is all around coaching. I'm a professional executive coach as well, a former program director, um, and we're working on building up an initiative across the institution on integrating coaching into medical education. Um, so happy to speak to you about that. Um, but for right now, we're gonna talk about direct observation. Um, and um, I really do want to uh, just say there's no financial disclosures, unfortunately. However, um, I do want to uh, just kind of, uh, for clarity, I do give a larger version of this uh, presentation at our ACGME Stanford Regional Hub Conference. Uh, and I want to give a huge shout out to uh, Jennifer Kogan, who's a content expert uh, and the primary initial source of a lot of this material um, uh, through the ACGME. So, Goals and objectives, even though this is a short talk, um, I hope that you're gonna get four main outcomes from this. One, be able to define direct observation as it relates to medical education. Describe some benefits of incorporating this into your daily practice. Make it a habit. Discuss some strategies that optimize it. Um, and then, before you actually walk out of here, imagine one opportunity that you're gonna apply in the next shift that you work in the ED with a learner. You think we can do all that? 15 minutes? We can do that, we can do that, all right. So here it is, the definition as defined by Dr. Kogan in this paper, and I have a full reference list at the end and it's in your handout as well. Uh, assessment method in which learners are observed by a supervisor while engaging in meaningful, authentic, realistic patient care and clinical activities. So you see it broken down here as direct observation being an assessment, but I put to you that this is one of the best educational modalities, not just an assessment modality that we have, and we have it always available. <clears throat> so its benefits are, yes, it's a CBME assessment tool, but it also is a fantastic opportunity for reflective pra practice and mastery learning around any of the history, physical, procedural skills, or anything else that we do in the ED. So Miller's Pyramid, you've all seen this. No medical education lecture is complete without showing you this at least one time. The direct observation is a workplace assessment that's right at the tip of the spear. You're seeing them do the activity that you're trying to entrust them to be able to do on their own in one, two, or three years. So one of the reasons why DO is so powerful is right at the tip of the spear. But how often was this happening? Before we started integrating direct observation into our EPAs and our assessment protocols, how often were we actually doing it? Well, there was a fantastic study of over 21 EM residency programs with over 500 respondents. Over half of them said that they had been watched doing an HNP less than three times during their three to four year residency programs. So how were they learning their HMP skills? How important are HMP skills? Pretty damn important. Okay, is there anything else we do as physicians that's more important? It is the data, right? It is all of it. And we were only watching them do this three, two, maybe one time during their residency programs. So where were they going? They were going to podcasts like this to try to learn how to do HMP skills. What a fantastic opportunity to get to the bedside and do some real-time, quick pearls of teaching. So one of the reasons why uh, many of us don't like to do it is because we think that it's, we're gonna kind of get in their way, it's gonna threaten their autonomy, it's gonna make them feel like they're on the spot. What other reasons do we not do this? Don't wanna take the attention away from the learner. Don't wanna take the attention away from the learner. What else? What else is in the way? Time, efficiency, all right. So at the end of this, we're gonna talk about some strategies to get around that. Uh, but when they actually applied it and they put uh, teach attendings uh, in the ED where their only role was to do some teaching, isn't that nice? Imagine that, okay. Um, the majority of the residents actually felt that the observation and the assessment was valuable to their education. They didn't feel that the presence of the evaluators was intimidating. And medical students loved it because they got to get one-on-one -on -one feedback from their instructors. So as far as their letters of recommendation and their ability to kind of get to know and mentor, uh, it worked out really well. So this was 
you know, in 2004, 2005, how are we doing? Are we integrating this more into your shops? Are you doing this regularly? Are your faculty doing this regularly? Just out of curiosity, how, how often would you say you're doing a direct observation on a... You're, I'm seeing some nodding here. You do it pretty often? Yeah. A few times a shift? Okay, anyone else? That's one of those that's a well-intentioned but slippery slope, right? Because the more you make it only for the learners at risk, the more it becomes earmarked as a learner at risk issue, and then it has all the baggage associated with it when it's, when it's happening. So what we're trying to do, and one of the things that I hope that you do uh, when you walk out of here, is to uh, kind of build it into the culture, right? Normalize it, make it not unusual, um, and, uh, and you'll be really, really surprised by how quickly uh, people uh, latch onto it. So about uh, 15, minute, 15 years after the, the studies that I showed you, um, this uh, uh, great study was done looking at uh, direct observation checklists with coaching. So kind of R2C2 type models. Um, but they still found that most of the time their faculty were not doing it. Okay? They commented that their faculty still weren't doing it. Um, these were structured episodes of direct observation and coaching around a pre-structured checklist. How many of you have checklists that you use in your ED? Do you have them with your EPAs? How many of you use EPA kind of feedback forms? How are you giving? So Jason, tell me about yours. Um, so I'm hearing variable uh, uh, kind of use of EPAs and checklist tools. Depending on your institution, this can be a really great way of normalizing feedback because you can go in, kind of watch the thing that's happening uh, with the checklist, stay in there, do your targeted direct observation, and then kind of step out because it's time limited. Um, they did um, uh, DO checklists with coaching. They used a behavior checklist. Both the coach and the resident used the same checklist so the resident was asked to go and do a communication with the family. Um, they self-rated themselves after they did it. The coach watched them do it, rated them, and then they compared. And, they, and then the um, observer was able to show, the, the, the coach was able to show the coachee kind of the blind spots. There was a debriefing ar around that. And all the residents felt it was comfortable, uh, and 98% uh, uh, indicated that it helped them incorporate new practice patterns into their day-to-day -day work. So this is like, these are the high-level outcomes, like the level four outcomes that we're looking for. Um, and it was okay, they, they enjoyed it. They found it was valuable. So don't, don't get it in your head that they don't want to try this, that, that you're getting in their way. As long as you verbalize it and normalize it ahead of time and you have a shared mental model, uh, you'll, be, uh, you'll be good. So. Uh, Dr. Kogan, uh, in this uh, great article, did uh, basically the literature search that you want around direct observation and measured the, the data uh, around kind of the level of uh, the strength of the recommendation, strong, moderate, et cetera. Um, and one that was strong that uh, I think what we're hearing here a little bit is, do recognize that many learners resist direct observation and be prepared with strategies to try to overcome that hesitation. All right, so let's talk about some of these strategies. So number one, strategy number one is target the direct observation around what the learner tells you they need. All right. So um, a good uh, uh, thing to use is an EPA, like we talked about. If you have a checklist ready-made, you can ask them, which EPAs do you not have much data on? Okay, which one can I rate for you uh, that will help you with your PD? And go in and kind of watch that and do that observation. That way it's a win-win. They get data, you give them the feedback they need. Um, or if you're not motivated by that, or if they're not motivated by that, another great question is, you know, who's your toughest patient today? Where's your, where's your, where's your pain point, okay? Uh, and, and tell me a little bit about that. And, and then how can I help you with that specific issue? 
Is it, uh, is it a code conversation? Is it a uh, patient's really upset about the wait time? Is it about kind of diffusing? What is it? And then go in there and watch them attempt it and then debrief it. And then you can go in and demonstrate kind of the way that you would have done it, right? So it's kind of these, it's proceduralizing communication uh, and, uh, and some of the other uh, techniques that we use all the time. So strategy number one is to have it land with your learner, just check in with the learner ahead of time and say, what are we gonna do? Let's do it short and sweet. We're gonna focus on one thing and then I'm gonna get out. Tell me what the one thing is. Strategy number two, I love this concept, is around observation snapshots. All of us, every day in the ED, have bite-sized interactions with patients in different settings that you already know about in advance, right? There's their triage experience, there's the ambulance dropping off the patient in the ED experience snapshot, there's the student going in and getting their initial history snapshot, there's the resident going in and doing their supervising physical exam focused snapshot, there are unstable patients where, st where you're in the room and you're doing rhythm monitor snapshots. So when you think about the breaking down the massive volume of our clinical workdays into digestible pieces, each one of those represents a snapshot, okay? In the hospital, if you're working with off-service residents, they're used to thinking with pre-ops, they're used to thinking kind of like that uh, kind of morning rounds versus board rounds. Break, one of the things I'd like you to do before you leave today is think about which bite-sized pieces make sense for your shifts, your zones, your EDs uh, that you could um, really kind of uh, uh, decide ahead of time. I'm gonna do an observation snapshot when the paramedics drop off that patient because I'm not sure if the resident knows the questions to ask them. Another, which we commented on, is teaching while treating, okay? Um, Another a way that this is referred to is uh, uh, observation two-for-ones or observation three-for-ones. You're gonna have to do these things anyway, right? While you're taking care of the patient, we're thinking about doing this efficiently. So the more you can be in the room to do that focused uh, uh, evaluation of the unstable patient, kind of the focused teaching around the abnormal rhythm strip that you're seeing, kind of watching them, having them kind of articulate what they're thinking, and do it in real time. That's an, a direct observation, two in one, treating while treating. And then strategy number four, and this is a huge one, is limit it, okay? Uh, limit it to a minute, limit it to three minutes, or limit it to three items, right? So you can say ahead of time and normalize this with not just the patient, but the family member. You can go in and say to the family member or the patient, um, I'm the supervising doctor, I'm just gonna st stay here just for a couple of minutes to, uh, uh, to just, uh, uh, just check in, make sure everything's okay, and then I'm gonna step out and leave you in the hands of Dr. X. And that way you empower them and you set, the, you set it up as normal that you're gonna step out at some point and they don't have to be worried that you left. All right, so create a culture of this uh, with the patients as well. And then once you've seen three things, that you could talk about or debrief, step away, okay? Uh, you've noticed that uh, they, they didn't necessarily make sure that the person sitting in the corner over there was uh, not the father, it was the husband, or it was the son, right? Kind of little things, just three little things and step out. Uh, and then this next piece is about triangulation. Don't forget about the importance of triangulation. When you're in the room, with the uh, resident uh, or the student and the patient, the tendency is that they all look at you, the patient will start to look over at you because they see you as the uh, more experienced person in the room. What you need to do is redirect them back. So this is, that's the patient, this is the resident, this is you. What you wanna do is you wanna try to stand somewhere in the room that you're not in their direct line of sight. You wanna kinda get off to the side Every time they look at you, look back over at the uh, junior doctor and, and say, what do you think about that Dr. X? And kind of give them the uh, authority again. And then you do that a couple of times uh, and the patient won't keep looking over at you anymore. So put yourself in a place in the room, off to the side, 
so that you're not line of, line of sight. So now that you've heard about all this, you know, what are some that you would be interested in trying? Like, what's one that you would apply in your next shift of these or others? Run around. Okay. When I was a young doctor and just out of residency and female and working in a um, two gurney ER for less money than you would believe at this time. My, um, we usually had one nurse on and one aide. And my nurse was a tall, black-haired, black-bearded man who sewed his own white scrubs. And most of the time when we both walked into the room, the patients would expect that he was, he was the doctor and they would ask him questions. And he was one of my best teachers ever, because I was right out of residency and really didn't know what I was doing, but he would always turn to me when they said, and what, what should we do, doctor, what did you think? And he'd say, yes, doctor, what do you think? He was great at that. So I like to combine, I think it's numbers two and three, uh, which is, um, I think three was, Oh, now, now we're gonna mess with my memory. Uh, so teaching while treating, you know, you've gotta be in the room anyway to hear uh, you know, the patient's uh, story and uh, kind of what their perspective is on what's going on, kind of spot check what the learner is saying. But also, uh, go back to, you know, I kind of like to create my own observation snapshots. So I'll actually, on purpose, go in and interrupt the learner uh, while they're ideally about halfway to three quarters of the way through their assessment of the patient. And I'll say, oh, oh, it, what a coincidence. It's, it's wonderful to find you uh, in here. Uh, do you mind if, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so catches me up on what you guys have talked about? Because I've created sort of a spontaneous bedside teaching moment that, that feels uh, very organic of like, oh, ha happened to find you in here, which I totally did on purpose. Uh, but then I get to hear, uh, the patient doesn't have to retell their story the uh, whole time. Uh, I get to sort of audit what the, uh, the learner's presentation uh, and their you know, potential plan is going to be, get to ask the uh, patient themselves, what do you think of that? Does, does that? is that a fair summation of what you guys have talked about? Uh, so get to sort of check in with the, the patient and make sure that, uh, do some kind of spot checking in real time with the, the only person whose uh, opinion really matters. Uh, so I find that that's a really, and, and I save myself some time because then I don't have to go solicit another history. Uh, the, bedside presentation sort of spot checked by the patient is a real time saver. So I've really come to, to like that as my kind of preferred direct observation. And then I'll either stay if I want to stay and watch their exam skills, for example, with a neuro patient, um, or I'll be like, okay, sounds good. See you later. Um, so I, I think that's a nice, uh, easy and, and non time consuming way to, to do direct observation. One thing I think kind of going on the lines of what you were saying to maybe for like younger learners, especially for the teaching while unstable. So in the triangulation, so I'll just be there. I'll try to kind of like fade into the background like I'm still there, but then they're leading the room. So any nurses or anything questions like what's the next order and stuff, if they're kind of put on the spot to kind of go through that whole process with like, of course, having backup and everything. But then they're just the one who's leading the room instead of having like confirmation each time, you know, going back to me. So that's, I think, something that helps to just increase confidence a bit more. Yeah, this is, you can do these very fast. Um, and, um, you know, we talked about the treating while treating, uh, uh, teaching while tre treating unstable. The stable ones are uh, opportunities that you can do uh, uh, some great teaching around physical exam skills. Uh, I do recommend a website called the Stanford 25. There are, um, they have videos of like kind of the ideal type of um, uh, uh, physical exam for things that you think you know how you're doing really well, but maybe you could, maybe you could even level up uh, on, uh, and then kind of focus in on the critical piece of that uh, uh, physical exam for that particular patient's visit and be done with your physical um, and patients ready to go while you're doing the teaching, right? So. Um, that's it for me. Um, Sally, I think you're up. <laughs>